Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and you click the video and you may be thinking, Green Scorpion, have you lost your mind? This is the dumbest idea for a list you have ever produced. Yes, today we are looking at trains in video games, but bear with me. A lot of times I like to do countdowns about something material, for example my weapons month lists. This allows me to look at the object as a symbol, as a gameplay mechanic, or as a plot device. A lot of games have ice levels, a lot of games have scorpion enemies, and so it happens, a lot of games have trains. But why? Why are these concepts so often recycled? Well, the word train comes from the Latin word tahere, meaning to pull along. It is a mode of transportation for either cargo or passengers, utilizing a source of movement and any number of cars, which are fixed to some type of railway. Rail transport was used as early as 600 BC by the ancient Greeks, and could be drawn by man or by horses. However, trains as we know them really came into full force around the 1820s in Western Europe, thanks to the advent of steam power. The invention was an integral part of the Industrial Revolution, and it has appeared in many forms ever since. With anywhere from 1 to 4 rails, one car or many, powered by steam, diesel, or electricity. Now for the sake of narrowing it down, we're only using trains that have some form of self-propulsion, so the DK minecarts aren't allowed. And as usual, only games I've played, and only one per franchise. So, all aboard! This is the Top 10 Trains in Video Games. Let's ride! When the first Animal Crossing came out on the GameCube, it was sold as a life away from life. Players were warned, Animal Crossing is a commitment that will suck away your free time for months, maybe even years to come. So the game needed an introduction that prepared the player for something big, and the train in the original Animal Crossing does that perfectly. After a run-in with KK Slider, you find a nice seat far away from that sleeping boar lady. A cat named Rover asks to sit next to you, and whether you agree or not, he'll plop down and start asking you questions. The dialogue here made my start in Animal Crossing really special. I had no idea what I was getting into. Rover laughs at you for not having much money, so you're suddenly hit with the feeling that you'll never make it into the new town. But at the same time, his joviality reassures you that even though you're on your own, you'll find your own way to live. Which is the basic foundation of the game, do things your way. The train station was replaced in later editions of the game, but as much as I like Captain driving me around, the train station holds the most nostalgia for me, and I was really happy to see it return to New Leaf. Are you looking for a real-time sink? Try collecting all 100 Jiggies in Banjo-Tooie. Not only are the worlds huge, you need certain characters to take on certain tasks, and many of the most elusive Jiggies require you to find the many little passages between different worlds. There were a lot of them, but the first that comes to mind is the Railway and Chuffy the Train. This train runs between Glitter Gulch Mine, Witchy World, Pterodactyl Land, and the Isle of Hags, and both sides of the Half-Fire Peaks. You'll need Chuffy if you want that 100%. For example, a family of Styracosauruses is having some serious issues. Holy crap, that's a mouthful. You'll need to take one of the Dino Kids to Mumbo's hut in the overworld to break the Shrinking Curse on him. Another one needs to be rescued from Witchy World's freak show and escorted home. Chuffy is also the only way to get to certain places. The ice station in Half-Fire Peaks houses a Jiggy, but can only be reached by train, and only if you can cool the engines down on the fireside with Gobies- Oh, for Pete's sake, really? One entire level, Grunty Industries, is effectively inaccessible until you open all of its railways. Drive the train into the basement, and unlock the doors from the side- oh, Seriously, come on! To first get access to the train, you need to defeat Old King Cole who has been called one of the easiest bosses in gaming history. And... Yeah, he is really easy. But I think I get the reasoning. Besides the final boss and the reoccurring Klongo, Old King Cole is the only boss in the game that you absolutely need to defeat to beat the game. Otherwise, you won't get Chuffy, and you can't get into Grunty Industries, and there are three special moves that you'll never learn, including the Claw Clamper Boots, which are needed to get up to the final area of the game. It may be a odd and mostly untapped addition to the Banjo formula, but Chuffy is an absolutely necessary tool if you want to save the world, and it does lead to some pretty inventive problem solving, even by rare standards. Mega Man 5 for the NES had a fairly cool train level. 
The enemy Metars ride little trains, you fight inside the cars and go on top of them, and the background has this nice strolling effect. Very cool for its time. And then you go toe to toe against Charge Man. <sighs> Look, I'll give an A for originality here, but this guy is not one of the better robot masters in my eyes. All he does is roll around and shoot coal from his smokestack, and the weapon you get from him is basically just a flashier version of a move you already had. It's going to take some real creativity for something to come out of- THERE WE GO! Mega Man Battle Network 6 took this admittedly creative character and amped him up as a locomotive-themed net navvy. He and his operator, Al Ferry, run a transport service across the World Wide Web. He saves Mega Man at one point using his signature move, the Crazy Locomotive. Later, Al can be found in Seaside Town. If you take his class, you get the chance to play as Charge Man for a while. It's nothing special, though his charge attack is pretty neat. Plus, there's a novelty of beating up viruses as Thomas the Tank Engine. This leads to a minigame, and finally, an optional boss battle for the Charge Cross. As a support character and boss, I really like the new design for this net navvy. Instead of being a man with a sort of train armor, he is now more train-like, but with awesome claws that turn into his version of the Mega Buster. His boss fight, and especially his rematch, get pretty fast-paced. He essentially spends the whole match zooming across the board at you, sometimes alongside storage carts that Mega Man has to weave between, and sometimes bombing the board with those red-hot coals. He gets pretty fast, and it's a rush trying to keep yourself safe while lining yourself up for a counterattack. His personality isn't much to write home about, but there's a friendly gruffness that works well enough. For taking an old idea and making it great, Charge Man pulls through in the number 8 spot. At the number 7 spot, we have the Forever Train from Star Fox 64. This mission takes place on a planet named after the William Shakespeare Scottish play that, if I say the name of out loud, all of my theater major friends are going to get really mad at me. In this mission, Fox pilots the rarely used Landmaster tank and must stop an enemy supply train. You spend the whole level chasing down this train, and you can see why it's called the Forever Train. It stretches forever! But as you catch up to it, it will fire at you with cannons and desperately detach some of its pieces to speed up. It'll even drop shipments of precious minerals in your path, but luckily the Landmaster can fly over them. Yes, it's a flying tank. You also get this one guy on the train throwing taunts at you the whole time. I don't believe he has a name, but I just call him the Train Man. It's fun to hear him flee, growing more and more surprised with every failed attempt to impede you. Like most missions in the game, there are two ways to end it. The better ending requires you to hit 8 switches that reroutes a train. If you fail, you'll just have to do it the old-fashioned way. Train Man sticks one of the Venomian prototype weapons on you, which still needs a power supply and is tethered to the train by a sort of heavy-duty extension cord. Well, I gotta hand it to Andros, he's the only guy I know with a train equipped with a mechanized battle kite. If you did manage to hit all the switches, all the better, as you can forego the boss fight and watch this really satisfying explosion. Yeah, take that, Train Man. For number 6, we're looking at Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. This game is just amazing. With a plot that's basically another get all the MacGuffins and bring them here quest, Thousand Year Door could have been a really monotonous game. Instead, each chapter takes its own incredibly inventive route. In one chapter, you're working your way to fight a supposedly unstoppable dragon. In another, you're fighting through the ranks of a pro wrestling circuit located in a city floating over the clouds. Chapter 6 isn't even about the location of the all-important Crystal Star, it's actually about the train ride there. Here, we have the XS Express, a posh train to be sure. But as we all know from the movies, a lot can go wrong on a three-day journey, and everything seems to be trying to keep Mario from reaching poshly heights. A briefcase has been stolen, the chef's galley pot is missing, there seems to be a ghost haunting the front of the train, and worst of all, these little creatures called Smorgs keep trying to stop the train. Mario finds himself wrapped in a series of mysteries playing Watson to the Sherlock of a peculiar penguin Pennington, who stubbornly keeps calling the hero Luigi. There isn't a whole lot of combat in this chapter, it's mostly atmosphere. The XX Express has the most music tracks of any area in the game, changing based on the time of day and so forth. You'll uncover an imposter, foil an attempt to bomb the train, and you'll get the chance to stretch your legs and do some real fighting during a pit stop in order to fix a drawbridge. 
the best part is that everyone keeps telling Mario how easy this star will be to get. I mean, all you have to do is sit on a train, right? Right?